Journey family, we are in for a treat today. I get the opportunity to get to introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, I'm not only excited because uh, he is a great preacher, a great communicator, but he's also a great friend of mine. Uh, it was all the way back in 2008 when Jim moved here to Bozeman to be the uh, lead pastor at the E-Free Church across town. And at the time, I was working with a campus ministry that met at his church, and Jim and I became great friends and He's not only been a good friend, but uh, I tell everyone, uh, whether Jim's around or not, that Jim's my pastor. He's been a pastor to me in my life. And as I stepped into this role and really new to pastoral work, you just sometimes you just get in over your head and there's things you don't know how to do. And Jim's one of those phone calls that always uh, would get his arm uh, around me and his life around me and help me take the next, next steps as a pastor. So I'm super uh, <laughs> excited about that. Uh, Jim, uh, most recently, he is uh, teaching in, on the faculty at YTI, Yellowstone Theological Institute. He is working in their preaching department and their pastoral theology department, doing a great job over there. But I'm re- I already actually know, because I got to hear his sermon at nine o'clock. You're our, I know that you're in for a treat, but let's give a warm welcome to my good friend, Jim Kena. <laughs> love you, brother. I love Bob, and I am so proud to see his maturity as a leader. And uh, so it's nice to, for him to be part of my life. And also, uh, I love you. And, and when I heard that I was going to preach, I began to think and pray about this moment that I would be talking to you. And so I am so honored to be here. And as you know, you're in a series of messages on uh, the parables. Uh, and Jesus truly was a master storyteller. And today we're going to tell the story that is found in Luke chapter 15. It's commonly called the the parable of the prodigal son. But I think a better title, especially for our purpose this morning, it's the parable of the lost sons, plural. And uh, this parable is especially relevant for our culture, our society today. Um, When I look at what's going on in all the different spheres of our lives, I, I think in just society at large, I think one word uh, that I could describe society at large is, is, is lost. There's just a sense of lostness. Uh, people have a sense of anxiety, uh, fear. There's anger, uh, a lack of purpose and direction in people's lives. There's just this pervasive sense of lostness in our culture at large. And maybe to some degree, you're feeling that way because part of the human condition is we long for a place called home. Uh, When God created Adam and Eve, he gave them a home. And the echoes of Eden still reverberate in our hearts that we long for that place called home. And it's a place of acceptance, a place of forgiveness, of healing and rest, Uh, a place where we belong. And so my prayer for our time together is we will answer this question. When you lose your way, how do you find your way home? When you lose your way, how do you find your way home? And what I'm going to do in this parable of Jesus is show you two ways we lose our way and one way to find our way home. Now, the setting for the parable is found in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. It sets the stage for what Jesus, the storyteller, is going to tell us. And for us to really understand the text, I want you to visualize three concentric circles. In this parable, you're going to see Jesus, the teacher, and then surrounding Jesus is a group called the sinners and the tax collectors. Off at a distance are religious people. Uh, They're called the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And look how Luke describes the scenario when Jesus is teaching. And we see these three concentric circles in action. Now, the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
Uh, Luke uses some verb tenses. Uh, the sinners just kept on coming to Jesus continually. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law kept on muttering and complaining continuously because Jesus was a friend of sinners. They coined that term as a derogatory term. Now it's become a beautiful one, hasn't it? You're a friend of sinners. You welcome sinners and eat with them. So we see two groups he's talking to in this context. The first is the immoral irreligious. They're the tax collectors who betrayed their Jewish brothers to work for the Roman government, the occupiers, and then they would extort money from them. So they were actually making the Jews pay for the occupation of the Romans. They betrayed their country. The sinners are those who decided to leave the practice of Judaism for different degrees. Uh, there's all sorts of people here. There would be the, the, the thieves, the prostitutes, the pimps, the Grizz fans. <laughs> all sorts of people out there. First service, a friend of mine over there was a, Gri was a Grizz fan. I pray for him. So, so you have this group gathering around him. Uh, you could call them the immoral irreligious. Second group is the moralistic religious. These, as I mentioned, are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Uh, the Pharisees were like the fundamentalists. They were hardcore. They were rigid. They kept the law to the T. Uh, they were also hard-hearted, judgmental, separatistic, and racist. In addition to that, the teachers of the law were the leaders of the synagogues. And these are the ones that kept muttering, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So then, verse 3, then Jesus told them this parable. Here's a curious thing. Who's the them? Well, it could be all of them. Or them, the sinners. Or them, the religious leaders. Who do you think it was? Them. He told the parable to the religious people. He's trying to teach a truth to them. This is what Tim Keller says in his excellent book, Prodigal God, that's from this parable. The targets of the story are not wayward sinners, but religious people who do everything the Bible requires. Jesus is pleading not so much with immoral outsiders as with moral insiders. He wants to show them their blindness, narrowness, and self-righteousness, and how these things are destroying both their own souls and the lives of the people around them. So the audience are the Pharisees and the teacher of the law. And the subject is, what do you do when you lose something? And I think there's a common response, a human response, when we lose something of value. In fact, recently, uh, I, I lost something of value. Uh, my wife, Kim, and I, uh, we recently bought a Roomba vacuum cleaner, and I lost it. Well, let me tell you what happened was, uh, uh, I, love, I love my Roomba. Uh, we call her Ruby. She sends me text, and she does work that I don't want to do. And so one night, you know, we just got in this, I'm getting used to it. I, I got it all set up that she was going to vacuum the downstairs. And so I pushed it, and she did her bit, and I went to bed. And, and then I woke up, and I got a text from her, and I was terrified. She was dead, and she couldn't get home. And so I went down to her downstairs and began to look through the kitchen, the family room, the living room, and I started looking around trying to find Ruby, and I couldn't find her. I literally got on my hands and knees and began to look for, for Ruby, and I couldn't find her. And so I began to freak out, and I actually began picking up furniture, looking underneath it. I was going, where in the world did Ruby go? I have lost my love. <laughs> I was so desperate. I go, I've got two decisions. Call 911 <laughs> or wake up my wife, which probably 911 would be a better choice of those two. <laughs> and, and so I was just like, I can't find this thing. And I was getting ready to go upstairs to our bedroom. And right off the stairwell upstairs is a small bathroom. 
And I think what had happened is I had not closed that door tightly and she pushed the door open and then she began to clean inside and closed it. Visualizing this is horrific. (laughs) She was in there going back and forth, back and forth until what? She died. So when I saw her, I rejoiced. (laughs) See, this is what happens when you lose something of value. When you lose something of value, you search for it. And when you find it, you rejoice. And so what I did is I carried her home. And she's fine, and I've apologized. Um, In this parable, we see the same truth. When you find something of value, you search for it. And when you find it, you rejoice. And in this story, really, what Jesus is searching for is for religious people who didn't know him, who were lost. He wanted them to find their way home. This parable is about how to find your way when you've lost your way home. So the story goes on from there then. The focus first is on the younger brother, the younger lost brother. Verses 11 and 12, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate. So he divided his property between, notice this, them. So the older brother got two thirds of the property and the younger got one third as the laws were at that time. What he did here was scandalous. This was unheard of because in essence, just as today, you normally don't receive your inheritance from your parents until they pass away. But what he was saying was, I wish I was dead, you were dead so I could have your stuff. But since you're not, I want it now so I can get away. This was unheard of and it was scandalous because he wanted stuff from the father, but not a relationship with the father. That was his problem. But the father did it. He gave, he gave the property, he sold the property, and he gave the assets to him. And it says then, the, in verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. See, he was trying to search and find himself by running away from home to find his identity and his purpose in life and to find pleasure and joy. He was liberated from the restraints of home and he would find himself through hedonism, uh, an unbridled pursuit of pleasure. You know what the problem with hedonism is? Is pursuing pleasure is eventually becomes painful. Um, This occurs every August in Bozeman. And every August, uh, there's young people from Glendive, Whitefish, Fort Benton, Deer Lodge, who make their way to a distant country called Bozeman. And then they squander their student loans in wild living in an attempt to find themselves. You've been there. That pursuit of pleasure to find yourself, but the problem with pursuing pleasure is it becomes painful. And at the end of this, it says, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizen of that country who went, sent him to the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods, with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. See, here's the problem of hedonism is when the money runs out, the friends run out. Um, I think one description you could give of people who are pursuing pleasure apart from God is they're empty. There is a hunger. Uh, There's a hole in your soul. Or as one person says, there's a God-shaped vacuum. And they're empty in their pursuit of pleasure. Um, You've been there probably. I have. 
where I thought this thing would be the thing to help me find myself and find fulfillment. And so the younger brother is this picture of trying to find your identity and fill that emptiness by the pursuit of pleasure. And I think really the reason maybe for this son's misdirection in his life could have been a misperception about who the father really was. Uh, A.W. Tozer is a great Christian author, and he, gave the, he made this quote that just has stuck with me. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. You know, I grew up in a pretty rigid, legalistic, fundamentalist, Christian home, and we had lots of rules that we abided by. And with all those rules and what I felt like the performance of it, I think I developed a misperception about who God was. And I began to view God as some cosmic killjoy that his purpose in life was to not let me have any fun. And that he had a perpetual frown looking at me as I was doing life in elementary school in the playground going, and that was my misperception about God. And if you have a misperception about God, then it creates a misdirection in your life from God, doesn't it? And so if my misperception was he's a cosmic killjoy that doesn't want us to have fun in life, then I need to get away from him so I could have fun. So I could find life to the fullness. So what we think about God is essentially important to us, and we need to think of who he is. I remember one time I... uh, met with a friend of mine, and he had grown up in a rigid, legalistic environment. And he told this story of uh, he'd gone to a pastor friend of his, and he was just weighed down by all the things he had been brought up with in the legalism. And, and finally, he just got the courage to say to this pastor friend, I hate God. The pastor responded with wisdom. He said, Tell me about this God you hate. And he began to go in details about how rigid and legalistic and how you can't please him. And he began to talk about the God that he hated. And then the pastor said to him afterwards, I hate that God too. Let me tell you what God's really like. And what Jesus does in this parable is he's telling these religious lost What you think about God isn't right. You have a misperception about him. And one of the best stories is Jesus, fully God, is saying, this is what God is really like. He's correcting their misperception about who God is and what his character is like. And so here we see the story beginning to unfold. So I open by uh, asking this question, when you've lost your way, how do you find your way home? When you lost your way, how do you find your way home? And Jesus tells us in this story. Uh, Now, notice the irony. You know, he's, he's talking to these religious people. The sinners are around him. And he uses the younger son as an example of how to find your way home. So verse 17, talking about the younger son, he'd gone off into a distant country. And it says this, when he came to his senses. Uh, Jesus is a master storyteller. So what he's done up to this point is uh, we have the setting, we see who the people are. And then he tells the story and it opens with this scandal. The son takes his father's inheritance And then he goes into a distant country, and then there's a dilemma. That's the classic plot line, isn't it? So you have a problem at the beginning, and it it reaches its, its, its bottom. And at the bottom, then, there's that redemptive moment. 
And everything hinges at that moment in the redemption of the lost younger son at this. And, this, and, and the moment occurred is this, when he came to his senses. He began to sense the senselessness of his sin. The first step in finding your way home when you've lost your way is to come to your senses. Could it be that your emptiness, your loneliness, your longing, that, that, that lostness within you is because you have been trying to find yourself in things other than God? And he came to his senses. First step is coming to your senses. You know, sometimes you have these epiphanies. I remember one time when I was uh, parenting, uh, periodically I would lose my temper. And I lost my temper and just yelled at the kids. And the kids just went to all the corners of the house. And Kim was went away. And I was standing in the dining room all by myself after losing control of my temper. And I came to my senses. And I remember saying to myself, I'm an angry man and I need to get help. And I began to go to a counselor and a doctor and talk about it with friends. Uh, maybe you've had that moment where you just come to your senses and go, this is not the way to live. That's the first step but not the only step. He, he came to his senses and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Second step, acknowledge your sin. You're a good God and I've run from you. And I need to come home. This is theologically called repentance. It's a picture of saying, I need to come back home. And then in verse 19, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. He came to his senses. He confessed his sin to himself, at least. And then he returned to his father. There is a time you get up and say, I'm going home. I'm going back to God. So when you've lost your way, how do you find your way home? Uh, you get up and go to the Father, the God who created you. And that maybe the reason for our emptiness, loneliness, lostness is we're disconnected from the one we're supposed to be connected to. So when you've lost your way, you find your way home by going to the Father. So, so he decided, I'm going to go home. And he starts the journey home. And as he walked home, he began to try to figure out what's going to happen. And he did two things, I'm sure. He had best case scenario and worst case scenario in mind. You'd do that, wouldn't you? Okay, this is the best it could go. This is the worst it could go. So here's the best case scenario. If I go back home, I'm going to tell dad, I sinned against you. Just make me a hired servant. I can get a job and then I'll at least have food. Best case scenario. Worst case scenario. Get out of here. I never want to see you again. How dare you take my money and run and spend it all. I don't want to see you again. You know what happened? Neither of them. The best case didn't happen and the worst case didn't happen. You know what happened? The better than best case scenario happened. He welcomed him warmly into his family. He allowed him to come back home. And when he came home, he received four things that we all need. First, an affectionate acceptance. Um, I'm sure he had a fear of rejection when he came back. But here's what the father did. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him. That's who God is. Um, if you have a misperception about who God is, Jesus clarifies that. This is who God is. 
He will warmly, lovingly accept you, embrace you, and bring you back. That's the proper perception of who God is. Not a misperception. He will welcome you back. And one of the things is we need this. We need acceptance. And one of the most important questions we need to ask ourselves, does God fully accept me? And if so, on what basis? And according to the gospel, God accepts us when we place faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and his shed blood covers our sins and we're brought fully into a relationship with him. It's not conditioned upon your performance. It's on the work of Jesus. If you're a child of God, you're a fully accepted child of God because Jesus paid the price. Second thing is this, he received righteousness, the robe of righteousness. Uh, But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Now remember, uh, who's out here in this group? Pharisees, teachers of the law, they knew their Bible. So when Jesus said this, I believe that many of the first listeners immediately thought in their brain, when the story of him putting the robe on him went to Isaiah 61.10, where Isaiah says, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in the robe of righteousness. Why did he put a robe on him? Because probably he was in his underwear because he had sold his robe. And probably, and we know he didn't have shoes because he probably sold his shoes to get food. And what he did is, in essence, covered him with what Isaiah calls a robe of righteousness. He covered his guilt, his nakedness, his shame with his righteousness. Um, There's an old hymn we used to sing when I was a kid growing up. And it says something along this line. Oh, when he comes with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Listen, what Jesus deals with, with guilt, the guilt and shame of our sin. And he covers the nakedness of our sin with his robes of righteousness. Um, Do not let your past guilt and shame define you. Stop beating yourself up, child of God, because those sins that we've committed in the past have been fully paid in the person of Jesus Christ. And we are wearing the robes of righteousness. Man, we need acceptance. We need forgiveness. And reconciliation with God. And the other thing is this, adoption. He became a son, not a slave. Put a ring on his finger and and, and sandals on his feet. Uh, The ring was a signet ring, a family signet ring. It was a reestablishment of his place as a son. Shoes on his feet. He sold his shoes to get food, probably. You know what the significance of the shoes on his feet is? In that culture at that time, this is how you could tell a difference between a slave and a son. Slave was barefoot. Son had shoes. The significance is, you're my son, and we have the privilege of adoption in the family of God. We got shoes. We've got a signet ring, and we're a child of God. Uh, So we have this acceptance, this forgiveness, and this identity. You're a child of God. And the last one is this, celebration. See, um, when you lose something, you search for it, and when you find it, you rejoice. And this is why he's picky on this crowd here, the Pharisees and so on. 
is because Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And when Jesus found that which is lost, they murmured rather than rejoicing. They were complaining rather than rejoicing. And we see this acceptance in the person of Jesus Christ. There was a celebration. Bring the fatted calf, kill it, let's have a feast and celebrate for it. The son of mine was dead and is alive, and he, is, and he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So God brings us home. So what's happening here is when you lose something, you look for it. And when you find it, you rejoice. But what about the older son? Well, he represents the moralistic religious lost. And he came home from work, heard the music, and asked what was happening. And the servant said, well, your brother's home, and they're having a party. And how did he respond? Anger. Uh, if the hedonist is empty, the religious moralists typically are angry people. You know those angry Christians, don't you? I don't like being around them either. They're obnoxious. They're demeaning. They're angry. And the brother's angry about the grace. So look at verse 28. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. What's going on here? When you lose something, you search for it. The younger son went to a distant country. The older son's just right outside the door with the party going on. But see, what God is doing, what Jesus is doing here is showing us God's not a Pharisee to the Pharisees, and he's not self-righteous to self-righteous. And as much as he loves the tax collectors and the sinners, he also loves the Pharisees and the religious. So if you are an obnoxious, self-righteous Christian, God still loves you. I'm trying. And he wants you to come home. There's, there's hope for the moralist and the immoralist, the religionists and the irreligious. And he delights when they came home. And so he's begging him. And so Jesus is good. He's such a great master storyteller. And this is what he does. He ends the story with a cliffhanger. We don't know if the older brother came into the party, or stayed outside. Which is beautiful, because he's telling the story to the religious people, and it's like, we don't know what he did. What are you going to do? That's his invitation for them to come home. And the invitation for us is, whether you're irreligious or religious, that you come home and find yourself in the Father. So I open this question. When you've lost your way, how do you find your way home? And I've shown you two ways to lose your way. Hedonism, running from God, or moralism, trying to earn God's favor so you can get stuff from him by your performance. Those are two ways we lose our way. But there's one way to find our way home. I want to wrap up with this story. Um, I was a pastor in Arkansas for 13 years in a little town called Siloam Springs, Arkansas. And there was a lady in our church named Marguerite who had gotten ill. And so I went over to the hospital to, to check on her. And uh, I found her room number. And when I you know, came into the door, it was a semi-private room where there were two patients with just a thin curtain drawn between the two. So I step, I step into the room and I look straight ahead and there's two uh, middle-aged ladies sitting on the chair. Uh, at the foot of the bed next to them. But I couldn't see the bed because the curtain was drawn. And so Marguerite was right here. So I turned to Marguerite. I began to talk with her. And obviously they didn't hear about everything I'm saying. And I began to talk with her. And then I prayed with her. Then I finished my time with Marguerite. So then I got up and then I, I walked out ready to leave. And I looked at the ladies and I said, you know, kind of goodbye. And I was getting ready to leave. And, and the lady goes, are you a pastor? And I said, yeah, I'm a pastor. And she goes, could you pray with my mother? And so I, I walk on the other side of the curtain. I go, oh, sure. And I walk in. And there's this frail lady that must have been like 90 pounds, skin and bones. 
my speculation, she was dying of cancer. She was extraordinarily weak. I wouldn't be surprised if she was on hospice care. So I, I went to her bedside and I introduced myself and um, in just the, the frailest of whispers, she quoted to me John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. Here's the context of it. Uh, as part of the upper room discourse, Jesus is talking with his disciples right before, I mean moments before, they go to Gethsemane, rested, trial, crucifixion, burial. He's getting his disciples ready. He knew he was going to die, and he was preparing them for this moment. So she quotes John 14, 2 to 3, in the old King James, and says this, in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Now, I'm such a preacher that I leaned into her after she said that, and I said, what does verse 1 say? <laughs> like a quiz for a lady who's about to die. No. I said this. I leaned and I said, what does verse 1 say? It says, ye believe in me, Believe also in me. That you're not, do not lose heart. Do not worry. Now I forgot it. And it was just this comfort, don't worry. And then she said, verse two again, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you and myself. She knew she was that close to home. Now, the rest of the story is this is when probably one of our favorite disciples, Thomas, Doubting Thomas, speaks up. Lord, we don't know the way. And this is what Jesus said to him. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. So how do you find your way when you've lost your way? Jesus is the way. So whatever you are, irreligious or religious, moral or immoral, the way to find your way home is to come to Jesus. Come home. Let's pray. Father God, uh, thank you for who you are, your love for us and your grace that you've lavished upon us. And Father, I pray that your spirit would work among us wherever we are in the different parts of our life, that we would come to you and find our rest in you, that we would rest in the fact that we are home. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for engaging with this content. If it was encouraging to you, we'd love for you to leave a review. Hit that subscribe button and share this content with others. We'd also love to connect with you best place to do that is journeyweb.net. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Just search Journey Church Bozeman and you'll find us there. If you'd like to give to our ministry, you can do that now at journeyweb.net slash give. Once again, thanks for engaging with Journey Church.